Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. <clears throat> As we return to our study and the challenge that was given this last week, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction? And shall we praise him for the many blessings that he's provided for us this last week? Shall we now pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you and we thank you for all that you have done in our lives. We thank you, Father, for your direction. We thank you for the challenges, the opportunities, and the issues that you have put before us so that we may learn more to leave our hands in yours, trusting in you to direct us for that which needs to be done. As we open your word and the words of your prophet, we ask, Father, for your blessing. We ask now for your guidance, that our minds might be opened, directed, and placed so that we might more clearly understand the path that we need to follow, so that we may become the people that you would have us to be. I pray that angels surround each one of us, that your spirit guides our thoughts and our interactions, that you will direct us now so that we may come into unity. For this, Father, we ask, and for this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, last week, I offered a challenge. We're going to, recut, we're, we're going to go back over this one paragraph that we discussed last week. So let's see what we are able to find. Brethren, your lives are sadly defective, and you need to be converted in order to be vessels fit for the master's use. You have lost much time. You have failed to obtain a correct experience. You have not been agents through whom the Holy Spirit can communicate. It is the Spirit's work to convince you, not of other people's sins, but of your own sins. If you had obtained a knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, whom he hath sent, if you had represented Christ in character, you would not have been a scourge to the church, but a saver of life unto life. Will you see yourselves as you really are? Will you humble your hearts before God and pray as you have never before prayed? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Now, last week, the challenge was given for us to consider this portion of Psalm 51, because as we discussed, David was not praying for others to wind up with a clean heart. He was praying for himself, that God would create in him a clean heart over these last 20 odd years. How many times have we seen others making a decision to cast people out because they are studying? How many times must we see this kind of a situation where others make this decision that the need is to remove others from their association rather than removing the issues that are in their own hearts. David did not pray, create in others a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within them. He prayed this personally. Well, I mean, this is, uh, I wasn't here last week, but, uh, well, you know, when we look at this problem, so I'm not sure exactly what you guys discussed about it. What was the challenge specifically? The the challenge at the end was to consider Psalm 51, because as this paragraph is written, this is a condemnation upon the church at that time. Yeah. And so when we look at Psalm 51, um, because we know that David, King David, who was a man after God's own heart, had sin lurking within him that he was unaware of. Doesn't doesn't this Psalm 51 come after he's brought to the recognition of his sin with Bathsheba? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's um, after he 
well, com uh, commits adultery with Bathsheba and then kills uh, Uriah. Uriah, her husband, right? Now, so that's murder and adultery. And, and the idea is that he can't, there is no sacrifice for sin that he can, can offer in the sanctuary service. He has to appeal to the new covenant, right? That's the idea. Because he says, if there was an offering then I, that I could give, then I would give it. Right. Right. Uh, the, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. Right. So the verse before, for thou delightest not in sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. So, I mean, we know that sin exists, right? It's pretty easy to see. And this right. is the whole thing of, of, uh, of the gospel, of the Bible, that's, that's quite different from other religions. You know, I, I really dislike when people sort of say, well, all religions are the same. Christianity is really the only religion that addresses sin. And that's why it's so hated. You know, it's easy to become a Buddhist, right? You don't really have to deal with your sin. You just have to do a few things, you know, or there's lots of other religions um, that don't that don't address sin in the way that the Bible does. So the Bible addresses the sin problem. And uh, I see just Kelly just showed up here so when you deal with you know like the area of addictions um the whole focus has to be upon yourself not upon what others have done and yet so much of adventism in my experience is the condemnation of others now sometimes you know it's just like how bad the catholic church is or how bad the world is you know or All right. I'll What's add that? to that. I'll add to that as well. It's uh, you. You need to focus. We need to focus on ourselves and not mm -hmm. on others, like in the church, but also in treatment because it's pretty easy to get taken up in the community drama, talking about everybody else, and you know that, that happens as well, and and also worrying about others. You know, I, first time I went back in the nineties, first person that got kicked out sort of thing i went to every counselor i was in a panic like let them stay let them stay and they talked me through it and i i could see what i was doing you know i was uh, more worried about others and it really uh it's a deflection from considering our own what's what's going on inside of ourselves mm -hmm. so you're saying that people can sometimes be focused upon the problems of others and, and and sort of make them feel, themselves feel that that's because they're caring and loving, but in the reality, it's they don't want to deal with their own problems. Yeah, but yes, that does happen. But more often in treatment, it's schoolyard bullying, it's gossiping about them. All of a sudden, the room goes quiet when that person walks in. Yeah, stuff like that. Okay. Well, I'm trying to relate it to just, you know, within within the church, even within the movement. So we can be concerned, let's say, uh, you know, somebody, you know, because we're trying to get rid of the Aikens in our midst. Right. I've, I've heard that sort of excuse as well. The problem mm -hmm. is, you know, this person in the church is hindering the church when the people who are trying to point out that person are probably doing more to hinder the church. Because the people that we decide are Aikens are not really the Aikens. Right. And the other thing about that is, uh, what was I thinking is, well, that one that's uh, uh, suggesting to everybody, oh, we need to pray for this person. Mm -hmm. And really, it's just revealing their problems to everybody. You know? Yeah, it's a, way, it's a way of gossiping. In, in, right. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. No, I, well, I know a person like that, that they're always ready to, you know, pray for everyone, but it's just, it's just their way of gossiping. That's and true. asking, for, asking for prayer for somebody, being yeah. specific about stuff. Yeah. The other one I like is uh, unsolicited, unsolicited advice is criticism in a cashmere sweater. <laughs> Well, I remember you giving me some unsolicited advice many times, Kelly. And the one time that I really, it 
didn't take me too long to regret it as well when you and Heidi were getting married. I'm in a panic. You guys are doing something you shouldn't be doing. you got to get some sense into you, talking to people about it. And Yeah, I I really saw my error in that. Yeah. And, Especially and seeing how, how successful it worked out for you guys. I, yeah, it was, it was a beautiful thing. It is. Yeah. Um, I mean, right now it's a little bit difficult, but, um, you know, God has his purposes and that's the one thing that we, we need to be aware of. I mean, uh, one of the things I learned, uh, when I was in Australia with Felix was, uh, that he talked about was, you know, being able to hear God's voice, to listen to God, you know, not just to, to sort of talk at God when you pray, but sort of to listen. And, um, you know, the the focus here dealing with, with our own sins. I mean, we're so unaware of, of things that are hidden deep within us. Not that we shouldn't be unaware. We should, but the thing is, We've we've done a lot to make ourselves unaware, to forget. And uh, but when we're criticizing others, it's because of those things that are undealt with. Anyway, Dwight, you got any thoughts on this? The whole point with all of this from this letter 30 of 1895 was as Mrs. White was being very direct, she had compared this was Psalms 51, along with Ezekiel 33, and she was going through different verses. And this started when we were looking at Ezekiel 33, 18, 19, and 20. Because as this states, when the righteous turneth from his righteousness and committed iniquity, he shall even die thereby. But if the wicked turn from his wickedness, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall live thereby. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not equal. O ye house of Israel, I will judge you every one after his ways. Now, the paragraph before what we were just reading has a couple of very blunt statements. <clears throat> Thus it is that the word of the Lord is to be spoken to the people. The warning is to be respected and the message received. The people are not to set themselves up to think evil or to speak evil of God's messengers. Now, how many times have we heard others setting aside the words of Father Miller? How many times have we heard it that Ellen White wrote for her time, but not for our time? That we need to consider the time in which her testimonies were given now she had continued but this, this has not been done in sydney some of the brethren have found fault and accused the messengers of god and as a result unbelief has been sown in the hearts of the people complaint of god's messengers often amounts to complaint of god are we to complain about god's ways are we to set ourselves in a position that we think that we are superior to what God has laid out before us. That's where we were at. That's how we were going through this this last week. Mm -hmm. Well, you related it first to about, um, you know, casting out people. Correct. Now, we know often this, this is done in the name of protecting people, right? Right. You know, we, we got to deal with these 2020, 2025 people. People are 25, 20, 25, 20. <laughs> they, they come up with all different kinds of things, right? They, they can't say, they'll say 20, 25 or uh, 25, 25. I mean, I've heard people say all kinds of things, but the point is they don't even know what it is that they're trying to protect people from. And, and they always have this idea of we're protecting the new people in the church. That's what I've heard. There's, there's there's new people in the church and, and we don't want them to be exposed to this error. So we need to, you know, they wouldn't even uh, allow me to, you know, to teach Sabbath school or to talk on, like to do a sermon. Even if I wasn't going to talk about the 2520, because 
The fact I believe the 2520 means if they let me have a position, then it's sort of endorsing the 2520, right? Which is, which is totally bizarre. But anyway, that's, that's the way that it's done. So we saw what happened within the church, but we see it happening within the movement. It's been happening for a long time. And if we believe that, uh, you know, the truth is the truth, we should be able to trust the truth. But also the problem is we ourselves have done more to hinder the truth than the people who are teaching error. Because when somebody professes to believe the truth, but is living error and acting in an unchristlike way toward his brethren, it does more damage than somebody who just happens to believe some wrong ideas. Well, one of the things that, that I've always had to wonder at over these, these last 18, 19 years that I have been exposed to and with this message. There was a party that was very faithful in listening very carefully to whatever Elder Jeff would have to say. And he would be very direct in that he would listen, he would transcribe, and then he would teach from the transcription. But I can't really say that he really investigated for himself. Now, when you're brought to a point and someone starts to question you and someone starts to hammer on you for what you believe, if you have not studied for yourself, if you have not examined these things on your own to decide what what there is that is important to you then the harder you get hammered the easier you begin to break that will that that will either drive us to study or yeah despair okay now mrs white is being very direct here it is the spirit's work to convince you not of other people's sins but of your own sins this work right now is very much an individual work The work that was in the upper room was an individual work before it became a group consensus. The apostles had to come to an understanding of what was expected of them. The apostles had to be brought not just to the very foot of the cross, but to the mirror that was giving them the reflection so that they could see what their lives had been and how they were approaching their relationship with Christ and with others. Yeah, so the main thing here with this sentence, if you have had obtained a knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, whom he has sent, that's the, you know, the mirror vision, right? Right. If you had represented Christ in character, you would not have been a scourge to the church, but a savior of life unto life. And so we have to recognize that we have not really been converted that we haven't been effective because there's a change that has to happen in us individually. We have God's given us all these truths, but these truths, unless we have that um, looking glass vision, unless we see Christ and we see our sins, it's not going to be of any effect. You mentioned something about, uh, having the knowledge, not living up to it, and, and so on. Uh, the, hypocr- the hypocrisy in my life has grieved me so much, and somehow God still is able to use me and bring me around. It's seeing myself, I guess, looking at glass vision, but it grieves me, whereas I suppose the other 
bad way would be to be in hypocrisy and not be aware of it. That would be very damaging. Right. Well, that and that's the problem that that in some ways it, it, it's easy to see when a person, you know, has has the problems that you have. To say, well, obviously I don't represent Christ. But when you have somebody who's high up in the church or in the movement who appears to be doing good, right? They're in leadership roles and they're active in ministry and so forth. It's much more difficult for them to see their hypocrisy because they've, they've not just hidden it from others, from others, but also from themselves. And and so we need to rec- we, we need to see this. We need to have this vision, this looking glass vision, so that we can see what it is that we've been hiding from ourselves and from God. We need that light to shine in the darkness in a way that it hasn't before. But God is always working, right? Just because we we haven't represented God, I mean, God is still giving messages to us. He's still teaching us. He's he's still helping us as we struggle, but it's the person who doesn't even recognize any of this that is in the greatest danger. Uh, An example of uh, this hypocrisy, not that I wasn't aware of it, but uh, continuing to smoke, I quit everything and was good for years when I first got baptized, but starting up smoking again and and, uh, smoking and even drinking. And nobody in the church knew because I was very careful not to be seen and I always washed my hands and face and changed my clothes if I was going to be around people from church and, and uh, even assisting in five-day plans to stop smoking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, very aware that of what was going on and feeling really bad about it, but not letting it discourage me to the point where I stopped coming to church or, you know, giving up. I struggled mm-hmm. with it, and and God works with us when we're struggling against yeah. sin in our life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very gracious. Mm-hmm. But those are easy things to see, right? That's kind of why I mentioned it, because it wasn't for other people. Yeah. Because I hit it so well. Yeah, but I, yeah, well, I understand. But there are things that 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 other people might not even recognize as not representing Christ because it can be, it can be presented in such a way that it, it's, it seems righteous, like the criticism of other people or protecting people from error. Right. So, you, you know, you're, you're kicking people out of the church in the name of righteousness, uh, but actually the motives are, are sinful. Right. There can be jealousy, all kinds of things that are causing uh, those those actions. Right. So you understand what I'm saying, that, that those things are, are even more difficult to recognize. That was, uh, that was kind of one of the things that triggered my disfellowship was uh, I shared some DVDs or something with someone that was just baptized and they really got stirred up because of that. Got to protect the new people. Yeah. So it's done in the name of righteousness, but it's it's evil. And and does it help the per, the person who's newly baptized? I think it confuses them. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, often it does a lot of damage when people who are newly baptized see how church members are treated. So especially you know people that they're friends with, uh, it can chase them out of the church. It can do a lot more damage. If, you know, if, if somebody's teaching something that's error and you sit down and you treat, treat them in a Christ-like way, you know, and I've mentioned before, my, my son Joe, his conversion happened when during a business meeting where they, the, the pastor was trying to disfellowship uh, some people. And, and it was the manner in which the church dealt with the issue uh, that showed Joe he wasn't a baptized member. I mean, he was just like 13. I don't know why he was at the business meeting. Uh, but that was the thing that changed him, is he saw how Christ-like the church was in dealing with, with error. 
that, you know, it was really redemptive and that the people who were, you know, wanting to do all this disfellowshipping had a very unchristlike spirit. So, you know, how we treat people, uh, how, if we're treating the erring in a redemptive manner, because that's really the way the church was addressing it, that does way more than just, you know, kicking people out of the church because of some error that they believe. Because when you're dealing with people, you know, with actual sin problems, you know, that's that's quite a bit different than to deal with somebody because they're teaching something that you don't agree with. How many in the record that we have in the book of Acts, in the upper room, how many were cast out from the upper room for having a difference of opinion with other of the apostles? Well, none. They were reconciled to Christ and to one another. Exactly. As you were pointing out, the sentence that follows this, if you had obtained a knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, whom he has sent, if you had represented Christ in character, you would not have been a scourge to the church, but a savor of life unto life. Right now, we examine a three-step testing message. Fear God. Step one. Give glory to him. Step two. For the hour of his judgment is come. Step three. It doesn't say that everything is going to be wonderful and you're going to be glorified. The hour of God's judgment on this world has come. These are the three steps of the gospel message. When we reach that point where we recognize the hour of his judgment is come. And we recognize that it's important for us to examine our own lives, whether we are or we are not prepared to stand before that judgment seat. Have we truly given up all of these sins so that we can be covered with Christ's righteousness? So that it can be said that the sins of our lives are blotted from the book of remembrance. Are I know we... when I'm. Go ahead. I know when I, I know when I'm not ready that I. I beg God to make me hate it, but there's a love-hate relationship with sin, and I just want to have a pure hatred. All right. No. And that and that gives me to stop it. Let me. Let me give you an example. I have many friends that have made the comment that because I choose not to eat certain things, that I'm missing out. They keep making the comment, oh, bacon is so fantastic. How can you live without it? Ham? Strip, stripples. Uh, yeah, oh, I, I don't care for that either, though. Because it's got so much wheat in it and is so overly proteined that my body just doesn't process it. And the oils in it. Now, I get others that are asking, well, why won't you eat lobster? Why won't you eat crab? Why won't you eat shrimp? And they look at me and they're just shaking their head. Oh, you're just missing out on so much. But yet all of these things are used in a large way to help keep the sea, the land clean. So all of these garbage collectors are what others are enjoying eating. Sin is the same way. Sin is the garbage. The more we're enjoying partaking of garbage, the more we are damaging ourselves. Now, uh, may I? Go ahead. That that one about uh, those animals like lobster and shrimp and sure. so on. So they're uh, they're the vacuum cleaners of the ocean. Right. I call them right. And uh, there's an actual uh, example of that in Vancouver, the Vancouver Harbor, where they were lo harvesting lobster. People started getting uh, food poisoning. 
they linked it to the lobster, so they banned the lobster fishing in the harbor. And that harbor was particularly quite filthy. After banning the lobster harvesting, that that harbor cleaned up in like two or three years. Yep. Quite interesting. We are faced with the same situation right now within our own lives and within the movement. So the Holy Spirit is the God's sort of vacuum to clean up the sin in the world. Okay. But does not, does not the Holy Spirit know what to do with sin? Amen. All analogies fail at some point, but yeah, he does. We live in a world of constant sin. We are confronted with sin everywhere we turn. We have to make a choice. Do we want to be impacted by the sin or are we willing to look to Christ fully and completely as our example? He's not our heavenly ambulance driver. He has battled sin when he walked on this earth. He has battled sin before he came to this earth. We have to choose. Are we willing to trust him? because he knows the way or are we willing to think that we know better than he now this next paragraph coming from letter 78 of 1896 as individuals and as members of the church of god we need to realize the special work that has been committed to us paul writes to timothy take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine continue in them for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee we have a very important work before us. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, writes Paul, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known to the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians 3, 8 through 11. Now here again, she returns and combines this with Ezekiel 33, 7 to 9 and Ezekiel 33, 13. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman under the house of Israel. Therefore, thou shalt hear the word of my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man will die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at your hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way and turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. When I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trust to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousness shall not be remembered, but for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. Again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die if he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right. If the wicked restore the pledge, give again that, that he had robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. Yet the children of thy people say, the way of the Lord is not equal, but for them, their way is not equal. When the righteous turneth from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, he shall even die thereby. But if the wicked turn from his wickedness and do that which is lawful and right, he shall live thereby. Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. O ye house of Israel, I will judge you every one after his ways. The saving of human souls is an interest infinitely above any other line of work in our world. 
whoever is brought under the influence of the truth and through faith is made a partaker in Christ's love is by that very fact appointed of God to save others. He has a mission in this world. He is to be a co-laborer with Christ, making known the truth as it is in Jesus. And when men in any line of God's work seek to bring the minds and talents of the Lord's human agents under their control, they have assumed a jurisdiction over their fellow men that they cannot maintain without justice and in, without injustice and iniquity. The Lord has placed no man as judge either of the pen or of the voice of God's workmen. Now that is very direct. I'm not here to judge my brother. I'm not here to judge my sister. I am responsible for my relationship with God and with Christ. No one else. No prelate, no priest, no pope, no minister, no conference official, none. And we are to warn the wicked, but that's not by judging them. Correct. Right. It's it's giving a message of truth, living a life consistent with that truth. You know, so what what we are doing in, in the way that we are studying is we're trying to understand the truth for ourselves individually. Right. We study together because there's power in studying together because God is in our midst. And we present what we believe to be the truth. But in none of that are we condemning others who don't agree with us. It's not about what other, you know, it's not about other people, if that makes sense. I think that's on point. Now, manuscript 56 of 1898 which was a non-published manuscript, offers the following for our consideration. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things that thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Second Timothy 3, 12 to 15. There must be a watching for souls as they that must give an account. And she gives reference right back to Ezekiel 33, 1 through 20. Is there not as great a need at this time for warnings and reproof as at any time of earth's history? Now, I'm likely going to repeat this question again, but I want you to consider something very carefully. A couple of weeks ago, a sister that was listening to Elder Jeff's, one of his presentations, asked publicly and asked directly, should we not apologize for the message of July 18th of 2020? Now, there was a point this last week where part of what Elder Jeff was saying was being addressed before our morning studies. I'm going to go on record here. This sister asked this question in sincerity, in keeping with her question. Should Jonah have apologized to the people of Nineveh for giving a warning message that did not come to pass? Brother Kelly, what do you think about that? I have a question for Theodore. What was the reason the fellow in our three-person Facebook group, uh, messenger group, uh, what did he say when you asked him that question? What did he say specifically? What did I say specifically? No. What did he say in reply? He said something like, you guys are false prophets. Jonah wasn't and uh, something else. Yeah. But yeah. Anyway, um, no, we go ahead. Well, yeah. So, I mean, that discussion went on for a while. I'm trying to find it here. Uh, what do you remember about it? Just basically him dismissing the idea of, of Jonah needing to apologize. Because he was a prophet in the Bible, and 
and were false. We were being false prophets, but it was a, basically calling it a false prophecy or whatever. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, like that. Now, in my opinion, Dwight, well, Theodore's looking for that. No, no. What? Well, I mean, there were so many things that God confirming it. When it crossed the editor's desk, it never would have crossed. Never would have got by him. Somehow it did. And it was published in the newspaper. Not only that, it went around the world. The world. And mm -hmm. the other thing is, is that when the money, the, the newspaper returned the money and doubled it by giving it to uh, uh, an Islamic charity. So there was a doubling in it. I mean, just so many things, so many things. So no, yeah, it was it was definitely confirmed by God. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. There's too much to read here. I don't think I don't think we should ever ever deny the way the Lord leads us. I know this sister you're talking about, Dwight, and if she, I mean, I can't I can't deny something. Because I know God was leading it. Why would I sit here and publicly apologize for the way God God leads us? Okay. So, yeah, well, so if we look at the movement, if we're going to discuss that here. So basically, God was leading the movement. Now, if he wasn't leading the movement, what reason would we have to continue following the movement? Right. If the movement has decided that basically from 2013 till uh, 2020, so a period of seven years the, and longer after that, that God wasn't leading us at all, that we were, you know, just following our own impulses. Why would anybody continue to follow the movement and especially the leadership that led us astray during that time? Okay. And, deny, and by denying denying July 18 would be denying all the light behind us. And we know yeah. that that when we do that, you know, from what it says, that they'll deny the light behind them and fall off the path from danger. And it also says, oh, we were in a delusion that whole time as well. Yeah. Well, if we were in a delusion, uh, the, the most consistent thing would be, uh, you know, if you're going to still re remain an Adventist, is to go back to the church because you were a part of a movement that was teaching error. Now, if you're going to say that the movement was teaching truth up until, you know, 2013, when it started teaching error, that still wouldn't be any reason to go back to that movement. Right at least not to the leadership that led you astray. But, you know, so dealing with, with the whole thing of July 18th, we know that we were correct as to the time, but God was leading in that. We have all kinds of evidences that God was leading and that Nashville needed to be warned. And I believe that that warning will, will bear fruit over time and we will see the result of it. But yeah, anyway, um, I can't really find a good statement other than, you know, I just basically what I said, base, that, you know, we had these, uh, you know, Jonah made a prediction. And we, we talked about that before July 18th. Yes. So, yeah. Now, in, in this situation, and here again, I will ask this question. Sister Angela, should the followers of John the Baptist have apologized to the Jewish church for his warnings that were given after John was killed? Of course not. Now, for anybody, should the early or those that followed William Miller until the great disappointment of October 22nd, 1844, should they have apologized for Miller having the event wrong, but the date right. We have a problem right no, now. No, uh, no, they shouldn't have. But, but to make it clear to them, 
Right, brother. Just simply to make things clear, but not to apologize. So here's our examples. Is there not as great a need at this time for warnings and reproof as at any period of this earth's history? Mrs. White was given a warning to give that was to go out to the people of Nashville. The church chose to keep this warning quiet because they didn't want to be embarrassed. We reached a point where symbols were coming together in a lot of different ways. And when the warning went out to the people of Nashville, there were many that felt that this was a misapplication. I had a conversation with one party that told me point blank that Elder Jeff and the members of this movement should apologize for embarrassing the church by putting this in the public record. Now, warnings will come discovering the hidden things of darkness. Do we wish to discover these hidden things? Do we wish to understand the issues that we have buried within ourselves? Do we wish to have this looking glass experience that Daniel, Ezekiel, John the Baptist all had? And I would add Isaiah. I won't disagree with you. My favorite one. Isaiah and Jeremiah. And didn't Jacob have this kind of experience? We are given these examples for our time. A warning message is to go out. If we try to hide the light that we are receiving under a bushel, what's going to happen? Going to become darkness to us. Yeah. This is part of the issue that we face right now. We need to consider carefully that we are in a time where warning messages are to go out. So I'm putting myself on record. I'm stating what should have been said and was not said at that time. When the question was posed by this sister to Elder Jeff, it should have been stated, we are not here to apologize. This message was given by Mrs. White and was to go out. Just because others were afraid doesn't mean that we should be afraid. We are to give a message just as Jonah did, just as John the Baptist did, just as Isaiah did as Ezekiel and Daniel have done, we are to stand up, present this message, and to use an old adage, let the chips fall where they may. And we know Jonah, Jonah was embarrassed, right? Big and time. and a lot of people in the movement were embarrassed by the failure of the prediction. In the, in the, in the sense of Jeff, I did hear Jeff said that we shouldn't, it, it wouldn't do no good to apologize for that event now. I'm not I'm not disagreeing with that. But the point being when the sister asked this, instead of being direct, it was a very soft answer that was given. Would you agree? Yes, I would. He didn't he didn't he didn't come out and say didn't say it like you said it. <clears throat> hasn't hasn't he said it not perhaps particularly but the idea is there that or is it just others saying we should apologize well he's saying we should repent oh that's it yeah yeah what, what you're getting confused with yeah so in this in this situation in addressing what we are seeing from the book of ezekiel and what has been written here in First and Second Timothy, and what was given directly by Mrs. White, we are to give the warnings and reproofs that God sends before us. As a watchman, 
we are to give that warning because we are the ones standing on the walls of the city. If we choose not to give a warning, are we fulfilling our duty as watchmen? Well, blood be on our hands if we don't. Amen. I don't want the blood of that sister on my hands. I don't want the blood of the people of Nashville on my hands. That's where I stand today. Any other thoughts, comments, or questions? And I would even take the risk of, war, war, you know, even if I, even if I'm wrong, I would take or well, consider the possibility that I'm wrong. I would still take the risk of being wrong, just because, you know, it'd be better to be wrong about something and than not say anything, if if that makes sense. Someone else, help me make sense of that. Take the risk of being wrong. Well, here again, there are a lot that we have in examples that took the risk of being wrong. One of the other points is that we have examples of those that were given specific warnings and chose not to directly follow all of the warning. Like the prophet that came before the king at Bethel, before Jeroboam, and gave his warning and was told, don't return the way you came. You are not to break bread or drink water with anyone. And what did he do? He listened to somebody that said, I'm a prophet as you are. Come with me. Even though God had yeah. said. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Dwight, but okay. even, even even he sat too long under the oak tree. Right. So we have examples put before us. Are we going to learn from these examples or are we going to set them aside? My experience on that day, I just went about my typical usual day. Um, it was like when 9-11 happened and my sister called me and woke me up to turn on my television. I was on shift work. I just went back to bed. I told my sister, well, we know th things like that are going to happen before the end of the world. And uh, I went back to bed and I just prayed, God, uh, if it's the end of the world, I was so tired. Just I went back to sleep. Uh, if it's the end of the world, help me. But with with July 18, um, I knew that I wasn't ready. So I just put my life in God's hands. I knew that I couldn't prepare myself. And I and I think that's likely one of the reasons that the that it was held back because we were not ready to be brought onto the stage of the world as a movement. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments? Then let us close our time together in prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have spent together and the conversation and study that we have had. We pray now for your blessing. As we go through this Sabbath, direct us in the path that you would have us to follow. May your will be done, we ask, for we need you day by day, hour by hour, and minute by minute. We can do nothing without you. Help us now in all things so that we may reflect your character and not ours. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.